excited to be here with you guys. So I like audience participation. So when I like look out to you guys, I'm expecting some kind of response. So I'm going to ask, how are y'all doing today? Good. Good? All right. Well, I am doing really well, too, because I get to be here with y'all, which is super exciting. I love talking to college students. So um, like David said, I'm a campus minister at EGA, and before that, I was at LSU. So, um, you know, it's football for me. I love SEC football. Um, it's always hard when I have to decide who I'm going to root for. So my kind of go-to is whoever has a shot at the national championship. That's who I end up rooting for because I like winners. But, um, which that's going to come up in a few minutes again. So if you're an Alabama fan, I'm sorry that I'm going to throw some shade on you a little bit later because I hate Alabama. Um, uh, have you ever hated something so much that like it starts in the pit of your stomach and it just radiates throughout your body just this pure hatred? That's the way I feel about Alabama football. Like, pure, unadulterated hatred. Um, in fact, I will drive around Tuscaloosa. I will not go through Tuscaloosa. Um, and partly that is because, as an LSU fan, my, I had family members that graduated from LSU. Um, if you know anything about college football, you know that Nick Satan was the football <laughs> coach um, at LSU before he um, jumped ship and went to the dark side. But all that to say, I am excited about being here, and I will cheer for Shorter because you don't play Georgia. Right? I'm just kidding. What, what is your mascot? Hawks. Uh, okay, so I graduated from North Georgia, and we just changed our mascot recently to something that I don't even think exists in Georgia, the Nighthawk. I don't think that exists in Georgia. But um, so I'm having to figure out what my own school mascot is. But anyway, so I digress. But we are going to talk about animals. How many of you have been to New York City and to the Natural History Museum? Have you been to New York City? Have you ever at least gone by the Natural History Museum? All right, so in the museum, I took some students there um, a little while back and on a mission trip, and we decided to kind of do a scavenger hunt. So we went into the museum, and there's a room in the museum that um, is dedicated to uh, all of the kind of like extraordinary sea animals and when you go in there there's this giant blue whale and if you have never seen a blue whale before you guys it is massive he's bigger than this room and it's amazing because you can actually go and lay up underneath him along with like 10 to 15 other people and when you're looking up at the belly of this whale you think hey that story in the bible about Jonah and the whale you know I always kind of wondered if a whale was actually big enough to swallow a person. But after laying up underneath this giant whale, I realized that is totally possible. And as I was laying there kind of thinking through that, because if you ever had one of those moments where like the Bible just clicks for you or something just clicks and you're like, oh, this just kind of clicked for me, um, that kind of clicked for me. And I'm laying there and I started thinking about all of the things that Jonah did to get him into the position where he was laying in the belly of the well. And that's what we're going to talk about today. So if you have your Bible or if you have your phone and you have the Bible app, um, I want you to get to Jonah chapter 1. And we're going to talk a little bit about, we're going to kind of hone in on Jonah chapter 1, 7 through 17. But let me give you a little context, because I think this is really important to understand about Jonah. So Jonah is a prophet, which means that Jonah would have heard regularly from God. Okay, so God speaking to Jonah is nothing new. So when God tells Jonah in chapter 1, verse 1, to get up and go to the great city of Nineveh, this is not the first time that Jonah has heard from God. Okay, so Jonah, a prophet, has regularly heard from God. Second, you need to know is Nineveh is one of the pivotal cities of this day and age in the Assyrian Empire, and they were awful. All right. How many of you have studied history and know about Vlad Dracula and what all terrible things he did? If you know, like he was an impaler, that's actually where we get all that from. He would hang people upside down, he would cut their heads off, all of that. Well, legend has it that he studied the Assyrian literature of the Ninevites and what they would do to cities and towns when they would raid them. So the Ninevites were pretty terrible. No one liked them. 
everyone was afraid of him. So it would have not been a huge shock for someone like Jonah to be like, oh, heck no, God, I'm not going to Nineveh. I hate them. Why would you? Why would you even want to save someone as terrible as the Ninevites? So when God tells Jonah to, hey, Jonah, get up, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because their wickedness has confronted me, what does he do? He goes the complete opposite direction. So let's just pretend this is a map, okay? My hand's the map. Nineveh is over here. Jonah goes completely the other direction. In fact, Nineveh is up at the top. Jonah goes down south to Tarshish. Like, he's on a boat. In fact, he's going as far away from Nineveh as possible. He goes into the bottom of a boat, going completely the opposite direction of where God has told him to go. All right, so that's the context. And now, Jonah is sitting in the bottom of this boat, and we have a storm coming. So we're going to look at verse 7 through 17 through the lens of three perspectives. We're going to look at it through the lens of the sailors. We're going to look at it through the lens of Jonah. And then we're going to look at it through the lens of God. So I'm going to read this to follow along. All right. The storm has come. The captain has, you know, freaked out. He's panicked. He's gone down and he has awoken um, Jonah. And he says, come on. The sailors said to each other, let's cast lots. Then we will know who is to blame for the trouble we are in. They cast lots and the lot singled out Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us who is to blame for this trouble we are in. And they ask five questions. What is your business? Where are you from? What is your country? And what people are you from? Who's to blame? Why are we here? Why is this storm? He says, I am a Hebrew. I worship Yahweh, the God of heavens, who made the sea and dry land. And the men were even more afraid and said to him, what is it that you have done? The men knew he was fleeing from the Lord's presence because he had told them. So they said to him, what should we do with you to calm the sea? against us for the sea is getting worse and worse and he answered to them pick me up and throw me into the sea so it may quiet down for you for I know that I am to blame for this violent storm against you nevertheless the men rode hard to get back to dry land but they could not because the sea was raging against them more and more so they called out to the Lord please Yahweh do not let us perish because of this man's life and do not charge us with innocent blood for you Yahweh have done just as you please so they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. The men feared the Lord even more. They offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. And now the Lord had appointed a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the fish for three days and three nights. Here's what you need to know about this storm. It says that the Lord hurled a violent storm, a violent wind. These sailors were seasoned sailors. They had seen storms before. It has to be a pretty intense and massive storm to get sailors, their whole life they've grown up on the seas, to be as scared and as panicked as they were. They had never seen a storm like this. This is huge for them. In fact, the Hebrew word here for wind is the spirit of the Lord. So there was something unique about this storm and they recognized that. And because they recognize that there's something different, who do they call out to? This is audience participation, Don. Who do they call out to? Yahweh. All right, they would have known who Yahweh was because, once again, they were sailors. They would have hung out at the ports. They would have interacted with people of different faith. But also, it gives us a clue of how they would know Yahweh would be involved because who is Jonah? He's a what? He's a prophet. And what, is, what do we know? It says here, what did he told them? that he was running away. It says here that he had told them that he was running away from the Lord. So they recognized that there was something going on that was above their control. And they reacted out of fear and out of panic over loss of control. And what I noticed about this was they do the same thing that many of us do when we lose control. When fear hits us and all of a sudden we don't know how to deal with our circumstances and our surroundings, that we panic. And that's what they're doing. Is these guys who are used to being in control, all of a sudden are no longer in control. 
and they try to fix it themselves. How often do we try to fix circumstances ourselves? What do they do? They what? They row. They try to get to the shore. They cast lots. They're like, we've got to figure this out. Okay, now that we've figured it out, what, what are we going to do with him? I don't know. I don't know if we can throw him over. Maybe we should. Maybe we shouldn't. They try to fix it. And I don't know about you, but I've done that in my life when I've lost control of a situation or a circumstance. I've tried to fix things. So we see that the sailors do a lot of what we would have done in this situation. And it even says that they cried out. These sailors would have been men that worshipped idols. They would have been men that worshipped things that would have traditionally been passed on to them, um, pagan gods. And there are times where we cry out to our idols, that we look to our idols to fix things. Our idols may not be pagan gods, but our idols may be money. Our idols may be time. Our idols may be relationships. Sometimes we look and cry out to idols to fix a situation that we no longer have control of, which is what they're doing here. But I love this, it's amazing. So here you see God still in the midst of this. He has not given up on these sailors. So when they ask Jonah, hey Jonah, who's to blame for this? This is not a question that they didn't already know the answer for. They're asking, hey, who's to blame for this? Where are you from? What is your country? What people are you from? I'm a Hebrew. When they understood even more exactly who he was, they actually call out to the Hebrew God, Yahweh. And the reason in your text that it's actually used as the word Yahweh there is so that you understand that they really did call upon the Hebrew God. They didn't just call out, oh God, whoever's up there, save us. They actually called upon the name of the Hebrew God. And that's amazing because they recognized that there was something that was out of their control that they could not fix and they needed help with it. So they call out to God and he, what does he do? He calms the storm when they, what, throw Jonah over, right? So he saves the sailors. One of the things I want you to kind of grab a hold of and tuck in the back of your brain as we move on to Jonah here is... Jonah's decision to not follow God's command impacted the sailors. The sailors found themselves in a situation because of the choice that Jonah made. Jonah's decision impacted them. Y'all, your decisions impact people, positive or negative, Every decision you make has a consequence, and every consequence impacts people around you. So we're going to see that unfold a little bit more. Jonah. Jonah, seasoned in his life, he's been following God for a long time. He's been a prophet for a while. We see that on in Kings. There's a reference to him as a prophet. Um, and we see Jonah in a very interesting season of his life. Jonah is caught up in hate. And I want you to really grab a hold of how full of hate Jonah is. You should not be like Jonah. Jonah's one of the prophets that's in the Bible that tell you not to be like. Okay? Jonah is so full of hate that not only does he run the other direction from Nineveh, and y'all, I don't think we grab a hold of how much he hated the Ninevites. He did not, when the, when the sailors got him on deck and they cast the lots and they were trying to figure out about throwing him over, if he confessed, and the captain, I don't know if you caught this, but the captain said, hey, tell us, confess. Jonah would rather, Jonah, what does he do? He says, throw me over, because I'm the punishment. I'm the reason this is happening. Jonah would rather die than go to Nineveh. That's how much Jonah hated the Ninevites. Jonah didn't know there was a whale waiting for him. Jonah didn't know there was grace on the other side of the water. His hatred for the Ninevites was so great that it drove him to make a decision 
that he was willing to walk away from life and walk away from everything because he did not want to go and preach salvation to them. And one of the lessons for us to take from that is, y'all, we all struggle with some form of hate. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter where you're from. I hate Alabama. I can be super judgy when someone says that they love Bama. I can be super like, nope, I'm not even dealing with you. But y'all, we all struggle with hatred. We all struggle with someone that we are prejudiced against or we are racist against. And we do not need to be like Jonah. Jonah's hate drove him to make a decision that was pretty terrible. And it drove him to make decisions that impacted other people. So don't be like Jonah. If there is something that you are struggling with when it comes to prejudice or hate, I want to encourage you to deal with that now. Because that, as you see with Jonah, is going to impact you and all of your relationships for the rest of your life. And we see that played out in culture right now. This is not a new conversation that we're having. But Jonah is an example of someone who was a religious man, who knew who God was, but allowed his hate to drive him to make some decisions that impacted others. And it was robbing the Ninevites of an opportunity for salvation. Has your hatred of somebody ever robbed them of knowing Jesus? Or knowing who God is? Yeah, that's a big deal. Because God chooses to use us to share about Him. And so, Jonah flat out disobeys God, driven by hate, jumps overboard, willing to accept death. But God, which one of my favorite words in the Bible is but God, because every time God shows up and it's amazing. God provided a whale. God provided grace. God, in spite of his disappointment and in spite of Jonah's disobedience and Jonah's hate, God still loved the Ninevites. God still loved the sailors. And God still loved Jonah. And he still wanted to use Jonah to bring salvation to the Ninevites. So he provided a well. And here's where we see one of those beautiful tensions of God's judgment and God's grace. This story, if anything, shows how God's complex character is that, yes, he is going to be a judge. He is going to punish. But at the same time, he's always going to provide grace. In fact, the sermon that he tells Jonah... To speak when he so Jonah gets spit up on the shore after being in the belly of the well for three days, and it doesn't say that he showered. So can you imagine how badly he stunk as he walked through the city of Nineveh for three days? It's a big city, and he preached the worst sermon in the world, and it's the shortest sermon in the world. Repent, God's going to judge you. You're about to be punished. I mean, it's pretty awful, and he stinks. But God used him because it could have only been God. And we only see this in this story. There's nowhere else in Scripture where you see a whole city comes to know God because Jonah finally was faithful. And he finally was obedient. And so that choice impacted the Ninevites, which later impacts history. So what I want you to take from this snapshot of Jonah is your choices matter. Every choice that you make, good and bad, always impacts other people. It does not just impact you. God created us to be relational and to live in relationship because he is relational. Here's a theological teaching for a second. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, they are interrelational together. And because they are interrelational together, God created you to be in relationship with Him and to be in relationship with others. So everything you do impacts others. So make wise choices. When God says to do something, you should probably do it. Otherwise, you might end up you might end up in the belly of a fish. You don't know, or you might end up on a boat somewhere in the middle of a terrible storm, not knowing what to do. But make wise choices, and always make sure that your filter is: Does this decision I'm making Does this answer to obedience, does this impact just me today or is this going to impact others? 
Second, I want you to remember that hatred has no place in the kingdom. Hatred can take you not only far from God, but hatred can cause you to make decisions to rob others of God's joy and to rob you of joy. Hatred can maybe land you on a boat, getting ready to be tossed over. There may be a well for you. There may not be a well for you. Jonah didn't know that. Don't let hatred be what drives you away from people. And then number three, I want to encourage you to remember, God wants to use you. He wants you to use you not just to grow your life and to be in relationship with you, but he mainly wants to use you to be in relationship and to live out to others and to share what you know about him to others. Because when you have met the risen Lord, it changes everything. If you have never looked at the conversion, um, I talked last night with my students about the conversion of Paul. Paul was Saul before he met Jesus. Saul was the worst of the worst. Saul came shortly after Jesus' death, resurrection, and ascension. In fact, the high priests that Saul worked for in the Sanhedrin were the same ones that put Jesus to death. All right, so this is very closely in the same time period as Jesus. Saul is going around arresting and putting people in jail that chose to follow Jesus. This is a big deal. He was awful. Everyone hated him. And he was the legalist Jew of all. And it talks about this in Philippians when he talks about, I am a Hebrew of the Hebrew of the Hebrews. I am the Jew. And yet, when he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, it changed everything. He became Paul, and he started the greatest movement of the Christian faith. In fact, a lot of you are here today because of Paul and his faithfulness. Because he met Jesus, it changed everything, and he allowed that to impact his decisions, he allowed it to impact the way he viewed people, and he allowed it to impact how God used him. And so that's my challenge to y'all today is, don't be like Jonah. Don't be like Jonah. Be like Paul. But ultimately, make wise choices. Look to who Jesus is. Share about him with others. And don't hate. Let me pray. Father, I just come to you today and I thank you so much for each and every one in this room. Lord, I thank you for the journey that you have them on. And Lord, I thank you for uh, creating them and bringing them here for such a time as this. Lord, I pray that you'll continue to, to move in their lives as they move forward. Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the gift of um, salvation through him. We thank you that um, he walked the earth and he experienced um, the emotions and things that we experience. Um, and so that, Father, that you know how we feel about things. You know when we, we suffer. We, you know when um, our hearts are broken. You know when we live in fear. You know when we are out of control. You know um, when we are just at the end of all that we can think of and anxiety is high and we don't know where to turn, you know how that is. So, Father, um, I am so thankful that we have a God that, um, that relates to us and meets us where we're at. Father, I just thank you for the lessons of Jonah. Um, I thank you that is preserved here in this text. Um, Father, give us the courage to not be like him. Give us the courage that when you call us to do something, um, to be obedient. Give us the courage to make choices that always impact others in a way that glorifies you. Um, and Father, and give us the courage to, to answer to our hate and answer to our prejudices. Father, Lord, and help us just always to remember that you are not only just, but you are full of grace, Father, and that you choose to use us um, no matter who we are, no matter what um, our past is, and no matter where we are struggling in our weaknesses, you will still use us for your name's sake. So thank you so much for that. And I pray. Amen.